Hello and welcome to the Esri GeoDev webinar series. This is the fourth webinar in the series where every month we try to continue our developer related topics and discussions in between Dev Summits. We hope you get as much or more out of it than you anticipated. Now we would like to introduce you to today's webinar, ArcGIS Hub for GeoDevs. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using your computer's system, speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce John Gravois, Hub Product Engineer with Esri, and Patrick Hammonds, Solution Engineer also with Esri. John, let's get started, shall we? Sounds good, thanks, Sammy. Uh -huh. Thank you guys all for joining us this morning, uh, this afternoon. We're excited to be talking about a brand new product. Uh, ArcGIS Hub is, is something that we've built to stimulate collaboration between departments uh, within an organization and increase community engagement with, with folks outside. Uh, today in the webinar, we're gonna take a look at, you know, how, what Hub is and how it works. We're gonna focus on the extensibility points for developers and and even part-time coders. We're going to dig into uh, hubs, uh, a whole bunch of different open source components that we've published that are, are like transformers help create the product hub. And we're going to try and give you some ideas about uh, other awesome stuff you can build with the open source tools. Um, we know we've got both customers and civic tech uh, type folks on the line. So we're going to try to talk both to how hub itself as a product can be customized and also we're going to talk about how citizens can program against open data and, and collaborate at, as coders as well. And we've got a bunch of demos lined up to show you rather than just tell you. We're going to try and cover a lot of ground, so uh, feel free to follow along at home. You can use the slides and there's links to external resources to learn and more. Some of it we're going to breeze right through. All right. So first, let's, let's we'll pass it off to Patrick to give us give us a back story. Cool. Thanks, John. Uh, hi, everybody. So before we get into some demos and seeing kind of the, the product of, of ArcGIS Hub, I want to take us back uh, to look at where we've come from in terms of uh, open data. So flash back to like around 2000 or before then, if you wanted data um, from a city organization or another government organization, you probably um, had to a, a little bit of problems tracking that down. So let's say you wanted to get parcel data. What you probably have to do is, is contact the Department of Records for your city or your town, and you talk to the person who manages the data. If you were lucky, they'd send you some kind of removable storage like you're seeing on the screen uh, loaded with all your parcels. Um, if you were unlucky, you might have to pay for that. Um, so again, pretty opaque time. A few years later, we started seeing a preponderance of uh, FTP sites or static repositories that might be updated once a year or twice a year, um, which is, was a great step forward. You're able to actually get the data without having to, to go through kind of a lot of hoops and steps. But still, as soon as the data was sent in by the various departments, uh, it was out of date. So you know, updated on January 1st, January 2nd, the data might be out of date. Um, so what we did is we created a, a way for people to be able to keep their data in place uh, in, in ArcGIS Online through different feature services uh, and different web services, keep their data where it lives, use it the same way, and then make it public um, just by controlling the visibility of it uh, through uh, what we call the ArcGIS Open Data. Okay. And so it's always been included with ArcGIS Online, um, and it's always going to be included with ArcGIS Online. Um, what Open Data is, is now a capability of Hub that is included in ArcGIS subscriptions. Cool, so now, 
I'm going to show a little bit about what open data looks like. And cool. All right, so this is an open data site. Uh, this is uh, the city of Washington, D.C.'s open data site. So as a user, I come to this page and I can start looking for data. So in this case, I'm interested, what I'm going to show is basically exploring open data as a user. And then a couple examples of how people have been taking that open data platform uh, to the next step, going moving beyond transparency. So I'm interested in trees. I look for trees uh, in DC. And I have a bunch of resources that are returned. So I'm going to look at this first example, this urban forestry tree trees. So at a glance, I get some metadata information about like where this data came from, a little bit of its history. I can see the list of field names, so I can see what kind of information this data provides. I can zoom in on this little map viewer, and I can start actually seeing um, where the, the data sets are taking place you know, in space. Um, and so right now, I'm interested in just a subset of this data. So I'm going to look at this data tab, and I can see uh, in kind of a table view uh, all of the data sets that are available, or all the, the data records that are available. So I start searching through, and I see there's a common name field. And I click that filter button. And right now, I'm just interested in ginkgo trees. So I look for ginkgo. And when I filter it, uh, it returns just the, the records that match. Um, filtered it down to about 451. And it updated the view in the map viewer as well. Pretty cool. Um, now I can close that down further if I want, um, but really this is this matches what I was doing anyway. So I, I want to download the data now to my machine. Uh, I click the download button and I get a few different formats. So spreadsheet, which we return to CSV, KML, as well as shapefile. And if I want full, I can get full um, bulk downloads, or I can just download the filtered data set. Uh, I can also access it programmatically, and again using various uh, three different various services and um, the full data set or the filtered data set. So cool, that's that's open data, and that's you know compared to what we were talking about earlier with the uh, you know having to call someone up and get someone to send you a disk of data sets. That's pretty straightforward and kind of a big step forward in terms of transparency. Um, but we've seen uh, some customers and, and users of ours taking this to the next level. Not just here's all the data, have at it, but here's um, what we are doing in your community. Here's the data to support it, and how, here's how we're making progress. And that's where initiatives come in. So um, Oakland County, Michigan uh, has taken big steps to prevent prescription drug abuse in their community. And they used open data to, and the data they had about, about prescription drug abuse to really support that and tell that story and show their progress. Um, so they created this page. This is on uh, ArcGIS Open Data page. And um, they organize this this uh, page around a few things. There's education um, with with different data products and maps showing, um, you know, the scope of the problem, um, opioid related deaths in their community, as well as uh, how many prescriptions there are per per, um, per resident. A story map um, about um, lost loved ones around the opioid epidemic. Uh, showing prevention and again organizing their data products around that. So sh saying, hey, this is where you can dispose of unused prescriptions, um, and here are places uh, for where you can find prevention programs, uh, treatment and recovery. Um, using their data to basically show how you can locate treatment alternatives and recovery resources, and then finally a story map kind of showing this is where we could go if we can continue on this path of of you know having recovery in our community. On a completely different topic, uh, Johns Creek, Georgia, took their um, finance data that they released, and rather than just overwhelming their citizens with, here's all the data, you know, again, have at it, um, they started basically showing, like, this isn't just the data, but this is how we're spending your money. So the end, the, the, the reason people wanted this information is because they want to know, how is my, my government spending the money? So they did the work for them and just started presenting that data in a few different, uh, few different views. So first showing total expenditures over time, showing the five different funding sources, showing what vendors, uh, you know, the top five vendors uh, that 
that they're spending money on, um, the categories of expenses, total programs by cost, as well as the full list of, of transactions if you want to do more digging. Um, and then taking it even a step further, but showing where in the country they're spending money. So this is like very inspiring, seeing this kind of work, taking something that was just about transparency and kind of checking open data off on the checklist, taking it to um, what work are we doing in the community? How can we organize our data around it? Cool, so what I just showed you was, was uh, open data, a couple examples of people taking that to the next level. Um, those stories are what really inspired us to, to go this direction of Hub um, and make open data capability a kind of a backbone of Hub. Um, what the Hub is, is taking open data as that core and organizing data products, websites, pages, maps, Around the around the specific themes and really operationalizing that, and um, it's a brand new product, um, and it's basically seeking to solve problems that open data on its own doesn't. Uh, it has some additional co capabilities. Um, first is like an automated initiative builder uh, piece, which I'll demonstrate later, as well as community uh, management tools. Um, those are additional capabilities that are in addition to, to uh, regular ArcGIS Online um, licensing. Um, and the whole goal is basically to broaden the scope of engagement beyond just computer folk and beyond just data geeks um, to really to reach outside and, and break down silos. With that, I'll hand it back to John. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Patrick. So uh, we're going to definitely show you some of the tools that you can use to build this stuff on your own, you know, right there in a WYSIWYG format. But first, I wanted to dive into, you know, get under the hood and look at some of the code that, that makes up uh, the some of the stuff that Patrick's just been showing you. So Patrick just showed off a bunch of really awesome charts that bring to life some financial transparency data from Johns Creek. And all of those charts uh, are created via an open source project of Esri's that we call Cedar. And, and Cedar has been around for a while. You've seen uh, Cedar in, in open data for, for a couple of years now. But something exciting to share now, I can, I'll, I'll show off in a, in a minute here. We've got a brand new version of Cedar that is, uh, it's a call it hot off the presses, and it's a, a pretty much full rewrite that's aiming to uh, improve display and, and, and the styling and, and make for some more robust chart capability that wasn't uh, present before. So there's chart building right there in, you know, you can make completed charts in your page to share with users. Your, your users can even generate their own charts right there in the browser with, without writing any code. But it's, you know, since it's open source and it's built on top of D3, there's a, a semantics and, a, and a, a JSON syntax for you to generate any, any chart you want. So the brand new, so I'll show you an example here. Uh, this, is, this is the newest version of Cedar. So this is in an open source uh, Ember wrapper that you can find. We have examples in a lot of different chart types, but I'm just gonna show you the line charts. So this is a multi-series chart that shows data from two different uh, ArcGIS feature services at the same time. You can also pass in uh, static JSON data if you're, you're not working with Esri services, but you can see here we've got really nice uh, map interaction. Uh, the styling looks pretty good. We can uh, turn on and off individual uh, series at the same time. And then the JSON that pulls us in, this isn't just raw data from the service, but we're actually using aggregate statistics to summarize uh, counts from individual records. So you can see we're pointing at uh, two different URLs for minor and major injuries. We're filtering down and only showing report dates within one calendar year, even though the data sets include more, more info than that. And then here we define the series, and this is an array, so we, we can pass in more than one. And we've got some overrides on the default styling to set line widths and, and colors and transparency. So it's uh, it's got good defaults, but it also is is customizable without you know doing much more than just dealing with the JSON syntax. So you know that's a cool thing for you to build a chart you know and land a chart in any page you want. You can do that in JavaScript you know anywhere. But we're also sort of taking advantage of the the uh, not verboseness but the robustness of the the schema for that JSON. And we're working on building more complex tools for users to build even more complex and great charts without code. So you can use it, uh, use it either way. So 
you know, I think at this point we've we've talked about what Hub is and something that's something that's used under the hood. But I, I'd imagine you're all chomping at the bit. So I'm going to switch back to Patrick, and we're going to actually take a look at the guts of what Hub is from the perspective of, of an admin. What it what it means to actually create uh, these initiative pages to engage users on topics, and, and instead of just looking at ones that are already built. So I can make the uh, Pat the presenter now, and he can uh, show you another demo of, of building that. All right, thanks, John. Um, so what you're seeing now is the admin screen of the hub. So you come to the hub and as an admin and you are launched into the initiative section of the site. So you can see um, all the initiatives that have been launched already for your org and you can also access new initiatives based on some set of templates. So what I'm going to show right now is how um, we can spin up uh, a new initiative around uh, addressing the opioid epidemic and as well as um, setting up a couple different sets of content to add to that initiative. So first I can go to the Address Opioid Epidemic Initiative and I can see a little bit of information about it as I preview it. I can look through the different sections. So first is about educating the community. Second part is uh, reducing unused drug supplies, uh, promoting treatment options, and then responding to opioid activity. So this, this matches what I want to do. So I'm going to activate this initiative. I'm going to give it a title of some sort. And I hit the check box and the hub has done a few different things for me. So first it has created a group in ArcGIS Online to hold the items related to the initiative. Uh, it creates a copy of this template and loads that into uh, that group saves the initiative item to ArcGIS Online and then handles all the sharing. So a, a lot of the things that I would have to um, do a lot of admin work in ArcGIS Online previously, it's automated all that for me. Hit OK. Now I can start configuring some of these, these uh, content sets. So uh, in this Educate the Community section, um, there is a website that I can configure. And that's going to be the landing page of the initiative. So I'm going to start adding data, hit add data, and it opens up uh, this, this data matching tool for me. So basically, we're trying to increase flexibility in terms of your data lives where it lives, it's structured the way it's structured. How can we match it to things that this application or this website is looking for? So I hit select data, and I'm dropped into a set of data that I can start um, looking through. In this case, I'm looking for overdose information, overdose points, and I've got a data set for that. I hit select. I confirm again. And it tells me attributes needed. I need the total number of opioid deaths. In this case, there's that field, OD underscore deaths. OK. It says one of three indicators, so I have two more set up. Again, hit select data. Find my data set. Confirm, confirm, and it's the total number of uh, overdoses. In this case, it's just a point count. Select, and the third indicator is number of naloxone deployment, deployments, which is the life-saving drug used in overdoses. Select, select, confirm, and then match the attribute to this um, n underscore deploy field. I hit select hit save and close, and now I can configure the site. And again, it's automating a lot of that process for me, so it's creating the initiative page and the site, um, and it's sharing that solution to the initiative. Well, so now that I set that up, I can set up, I'm gonna set up one more piece of content. Um, actually, I've already configured this, so um, I'm going to look for dev as an app. And I've got a uh, drug drop-off centers application that we've already set up. So I hit select. And now that's been added to my initiative. So if I go to edit the page, I'm taken into the layout builder um, view. So you can see these. there's some content there that's already been set up for us. So these are statistics cards, which is a type of content you can add to pages and sites in, in ArcGIS Hub. And they are already set up for us because that was what that field matching tool did. 
And I've also got a set of just kind of starter templates to get us going. So I'm going to embed that app that I just set up. So to do that, I can view. And I grab that URL. And I'm going to go to my layout builder and select the iframe content. And I just drag it into the site. Hit the config icon. It's asking for a URL to the content, um, the iframe height, and then a title for screen readers. So the title does is it actually helps uh, screen readers uh, for people who are are uh, have, uh, visibility um, issues. And set the iframe height to 600. I'm going to title it drag, drop off locator. Hit apply. And now that app that we've set up has been embedded in the site. Cool. And I can just go back and save that. So what I just showed is how, how easy it is to get um, from, from starting to launching an initiative and configuring content. And now back to John. Awesome. Uh, thanks, uh, Patrick. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of uh, exciting stuff to unpack there. But, you know, just to recap, you still have to bring your own open data to the equation for these, uh, this initiative builder. We don't, we don't provide you with the data. But the thing that's really powerful is uh, there's two different things that I really like about this. One, the configuration is more flexible. If, if you saw from Patrick's demo, we're not asking for a very, very specific schema. Uh, if you've got a field name uh, one way and, and you just tell us one time what your, your field name is, we're just going to allow you to configure it, leaving the data alone. So it, it makes a lot less of a burden on from a data management perspective. But then the other key capability of Hub is that that configuration of the, indica the key indicators for the initiative that Patrick hooked up, he wasn't configuring every individual app all of the apps are going to light up with that configuration after you do it one time. So that automates a big portion and allows you to really more rapidly build out and, and configure these, these initiatives. And we've got a lot of great off-the-shelf components to try to guide you towards citizen engagement and, and make sure you're gathering info and, and communicating a story. But you're also, it's customizable because you can provide your own, you know, uh, apps the way Patrick showed. You can customize the look and feel of the page. You can use uh, Bootstrap and, and, and CSS of your own. You're not, you're not sort of beholden to the way that we think the page should look. So we want to set you up with some um, good defaults and then let you make your own decisions and, and as developers customize that and extend it and, and share what you're doing with everybody else. So uh, Patrick showed off. Uh, an app that was configurable. Some people are more familiar with this than others, but this idea of, of writing an app, it's not just hard coded to one data set, but something that's going to load different data dynamically. I'm just going to show off a couple of apps here. These are in ArcGIS Online when you uh, save a web map and, and share it using a web application template. Uh, I'm going to compare and contrast here one on uh, US counties and another one for uh, Ice Age flooding in Washington state. And these are exactly the same app. So the same JavaScript code is, is running both of these apps, but they look totally different because they're loading in different web maps and they're also taking on uh, different themes, the color of the bar, and you've got different tools here. That's all passed in via JSON configuration parameters. So when, when authors in ArcGIS Online create new content, that's just a little bit of JSON that get, gets passed to the same app. So making your app smart enough to read in the data on the fly and take advantage of this concept of shared themes in, in ArcGIS Online, we, you could read a little bit more about that, is something that takes an app which might have just been a solution for one community and all of a sudden makes it something that any, anybody can deploy and use right away. So we think that's a really powerful paradigm. We're using in Hub, we're building on top of some of the uh, concepts and, and, and practices in ArcGIS Online itself. But the other thing I wanted to highlight is, uh, this is another open source project in the ISRI uh, GitHub org, 
these are examples and, and templates and, and a utility library for uh, the ArcGIS JavaScript API that makes it really easy for you to load in some of these parameters and know what to do with them and, and deal with things like state in, in URL. So you can see some really stripped down boilerplate code. Uh, you can see some more complex examples. I threw an example in here the other day for Hub that, that deals with authentication so that you know these community users can create a new account automatically with a social media login. So you can check that out. We've got examples in TypeScript uh, and JavaScript as well. But this is something that's more complex, but I think it, it can provide a lot of value and help you know help you steward change not just in your community, but uh, in more communities, especially as a partner or a, a consultant to, to ship something that, that lots of different communities can use instead of just one. So um, can we talk about configurable apps um, and we want to pass it back to Patrick because he's going to show off some of the community admin tools for Hub that, that actually help you engage these users and keep track. So I'm going to make Patrick the presenter again here and, and I'm sure he's not muted this time. Not John. I do some of my best talking when I knew it. <laughs> sure, I had some great, great <laughs> All right, so uh, what I'm showing here, what you're seeing is, is the page we just set up. And what I'm going to show is the experience of coming to the initiative um, completely new from just a citizen um, perspective. So I'm a citizen interested in what um, Montgomery County is doing about the opioid epidemic in my community. Um, and I come to this, this uh, page that I heard about. Start browsing through some of the content. I'm like, okay, that looks pretty cool. There's an app I can check out later. Um, all right, that sounds interesting. I, I want to know, um, you know if there's any updates about this or maybe if there's, there's something coming up that I can, that I can follow. So there's at the very bottom of the section, um, I, there's a follow button. I hit follow and what comes up is um, a prompt to sign in or sign up. So if I already have an organizational uh, account or an ArcGIS online account, I can just sign in with the organization. Um, or I can sign in with uh, social logins through either Facebook or Google. In this case, I'm gonna sign in using Facebook. I hit using Facebook and it, um, it logs me in. Okay, so now back in, back in the office, now I'm from an administrative standpoint working for Montgomery County. Um, I am, am in the community section of the Hub Admin. Uh, first thing that comes up is basically an at-a-glance dashboard of uh, all of the um, subscriptions and, and following that community members have done uh, around initiatives in our, in our community. Um, and I can also look at the, all of the members specifically and, and see who's signed up and, and for what. In this case, we just set up the uh, Address Opioid Epidemic Webinar initiative, and you can see Patrick Hammonds uh, signed up as and followed. So if I wanted to, I also wanted to come in here and email um, folks about a different initiative, and this was about, um, about vacant lots. So if I go through here, I can click at vacant lot opportunities, I click that initiative, I can see three people have signed up, had email members, and I can copy their emails to um, my clipboard and I can just put that into email client of choice and let them know that, that, um, that we've made some progress on, on that initiative. So I can also go into content and I can see all of the content um, and pages and maps that have been created um, in our organization. So our citizens have been doing some pretty cool work and I'm just, I can get an at a glance information about what, what they've been creating. Um, if they are making comments about data sets or applications, I can respond directly to that through the comments tab. Um, and I can, I can publish or remove comments. I can, I can respond directly. Um, just to get a sense of that, that kind of two-way communication stream around data sets and applications and specifically the initiatives. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna do is we have this events tab. And this is, for me, one of the more exciting things. As a, as a meetup organizer, it's really great to be able to set up, to set up events. Um, but we can do it all within ArcGIS Hub. So you can see all the upcoming events we have set up. In this case, I'm going to create a new event and I'm going to call it um, 
come learn about the new initiative. And location is going to be with Payne Township Hall. And I'm going to set it up for next Monday from 1.30 to 2.30. Hit apply. Organize your name. Just going to be Patrick. Put in my email. Give it a, a brief description. I'll change that later. Um, and then I can actually uh, relate it to uh, an, an initiative. So in this case, this is the initiative we're interested in. Um, select the site for the event page, uh, address open eviction. So now this, this event has been associated with not only the initiative, but the actual page that we created. I hit save, and it does a lot of the same administrative work in the back end. It creates the event, and it creates a group to hold all of the event attendees, um, and then creates a, a page to, to launch the event. Cool. So now if I go back to my initiatives and to the initiative we started setting up, I can drop this um, an event directly into the site to announce it to the community. So I go to Layout Builder, and I select the event card, drop it in. And hit the configuration icon. Uh, and the only thing I can do is select an event. So I select the event we just um, set up. And yes, I want to show contact information. Yes, I want to show the title. And now it's dropped that in with uh, including the location of the event. And I can even uh, drop in a, an event registration button so people can can register directly on the site. Cool, so what I just showed was um, how citizens would experience the initiative page on the outside, how they would be able to sign up and follow an initiative. Um, for administrators, how they would be able to manage their, their user community and their community around their initiatives. And then also how to increase that two-way communication stream and uh, organize events and set up events and announce those on the site. And I'll send it back to John. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that, Patrick. So, you know, we're excited about the new tools for community engagement. And we really think that this concept of using initiatives to, to, to talk about and, and rally folks around the issues that they care about in their own community is, is a lot more enticing to a broader range of folks than just open data for the sake of open data. Um, but we don't want to leave behind these the, the nerds either, the, the citizen coders. So, um, you know, we, we want to have tools out of the box, tools and 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 codes for developers, citizens as well, not just the folks that that are paying for Esri software, but for everybody in the community. So there's a lot of different options. We've got a lot of APIs, but the the thing that stands out the most is is a new uh, API we've written for Python, and it's good for a lot of different reasons for this this type of a thing. One is uh, you don't need an Esri license for it. It's it's something that's packaged with Arches Pro, but it's also distributed via Conda, so anybody can get a hold of it for free. It in integrates with a lot of other open source packages in the broader Python community, and that, that's something that's a lot of fun and, and most open source nerds get excited about. And it allows uh, citizens to you know do their own analysis and it's something you can you know you can write a batch script to do some Python but Jupyter notebooks are the thing that uh, oh man I got all my old ones bear with me here so this is the the Python page uh, a Jupyter notebook here is if, so if you haven't already seen it this is a way to sort of interactively write some Python and share your work so I'm not going to get really into the details because we did a whole webinar a few weeks ago in this series dedicated to the Python API. So I definitely recommend you check that out if you're interested in more info. But to the gist of it is that, you know, a Python notebook in particular, I'm sorry, a Jupyter notebook in particular is a really awesome tool because 
it helps you visualize and run the code and and contextually describe and and, and defend the methodology all in the same place so it's a lot more digestible and and shareable than just here's a python script you know read through the code comments you can see in this sample we put this on github this is an analysis on uh, bike and pedestrian um, fatality data so it's using both the arcgis python api and, and geopandas which is a popular uh, open source python lib and matplotlib for creating charts so you can see here you can use this python api to fetch the data from hub pull it down you you work with the raw service and fetch down that data so here we create a new feature layer loop through the fields to display the metadata do some aggregation and summarizing of the number of features in the data set and then visualize it in the api so here we've got an interactive map widget that is something that can be triggered via just a couple of lines of code so talking through this sort of analysis is something i find really compelling and we see this as a sort of powerful tool for citizen coders to basically rally around initiatives that that the government is defining they, they can go in and try to analyze the root causes of the problems they can try to propose solutions if they feel like something's falling through the cracks they can you know create a counter narrative and really have a two-way dialogue and, and we feel like that's something that's really powerful we want to make that available and i keep saying anybody can get the python api and anybody can work with open data you don't need to pass a token uh to work with these esri services that's that's something that can be done anonymously but hub also the community admin tools that patrick showed this idea that all of these citizens have a an, an arcgis identity unlocks a lot of powerful capability as well. It allows them to go out and do uh, survey work using Survey123 or, or Collector, some of our out-of-the-box products, for developers to write custom applications that leverage that identity for uh, content creation or, and some of these other things. There's a lot of opportunities that are open up there as well. And just this idea that signing up and following an initiative automatically lets you use social login or a, a regular account to uh, get started, then at an event, you don't have to spend the first hour signing up people in emails and trying to give them access to ArcGIS Online and manage permissions in your own org. The community org is a, a sandbox where there's, they're distinct from your operational data, but you're selectively collaborating on, on, on topics and, and getting a lot done. So that, that's pretty powerful too. So um, on the, and on the a totally different gear, just, this is a, John's tour of the, the open source bits under the hood of, of Hub. This is in, back to JavaScript, which is where I feel the most comfortable. Um, we just open sourced this, I think it was last week. We've been working on it, uh, just getting it started, and, and we're, we're, we're happy to be sort of developing it in the open. And this is really low level. This is for the, the neckbeards out there. These are utility methods and, and really small wrappers. You could call them microservices. Uh, you could call them, I don't know, you can call them something else if you want. But the idea here was we wanted some wrappers that make it really easy and, and, and nice to make calls to the ArcGIS REST API. And we wanted to make sure it was agnostic between Node.js and the browser. We wanted to make sure it didn't rely on any particular framework. So we wrote it in, in TypeScript and we're shipping this as vanilla JavaScript as well. So it doesn't matter which one of those you want to use. It's promise based. We use, you know, there's so much async stuff going on. Uh, we, we've done stuff in the past with callbacks and we've had a lot of projects where people were writing their own XML HTTP requests. Uh, we've seen that all over the place and that's inside Esri and customers. So the developers I've talked to have been pretty, a lot of them have been pretty excited about this. Um, and to jump again, bear with me because I got like 10 browser tabs open. Um, you can see here the documentation, the documentation page. This is a just got shipped. We've got a few different wrappers and functionality right now for authentication, for geocoding, for items and groups, some of the core components of the REST uh, API, but there's still a lot we haven't covered. The idea is that uh, this is an expansive topic, but we wanted to sort of create something authoritative that you can use uh, that we're actually using. So Hub uses this under the hood. The ArcGIS developers website team, that's a totally different development team. Uh, Hub, you know, those guys like Ember, the developers team, they like Angular. 
this is something that's underneath both of those frameworks that they can both use. It's, it's not opinionated and it doesn't require a particular framework. So it's something that we th I think is pretty exciting for, hopefully it'll be exciting for some of you guys as well. And you can dig into that and, and get involved in the discussion on GitHub if you're, if you're interested. All right, so back to the topic of these hub ready apps or configurable versus hard coded. And um, I, I showed you an example earlier of a Python API, a Jupyter notebook that's pretty hard coded. It's going for Washington DC data. You could get in there and, and change a couple lines of code and make that work in another city. So it's, it's really still interesting to share and a, and a cool thing to collaborate on. But we also showed you some configurable apps where the same app, you can just point it at different data and it, it'll, it'll work. Uh, so this concept of the spectrum and, and that the far end of the spectrum being uh, hub readiness, where it, you can point any data at it, you can point uh, any theme and style at it and it'll look different without writing any more code. That's kind of what we call the gold standard or, or the, the thing we're all uh, uh, trying to aspire to. And there's a lot of tenets of this, and we're going to see different apps sort of check the boxes on, on, you know, not all of this stuff, but as, as many of these things as you can. So if you're thinking in your own development about uh, writing something that can be shared and deployed in communities around the world, for us, the gold standard, it, it involves, you know, interacting with ArcGIS content and, I, and, and using ArcGIS identity, using the themes that are already embedded in the organization so that the, the, the configuration, the style doesn't have, it, have to happen through the code. Um, we're, we're really interested in durable state and, and letting users share the URL of the app the way it looks to them right now, zoomed into a particular location and having certain data so that, that users can be authors and vice versa, so that the dialogue, so there's really two-way communication. Uh, accessibility is obviously important to us and a lot of our customers and, and the broader public. Uh, being indicator aware and, and, and knowing about uh, the particular key data sets that underpin an initiative. Uh, there's also tracking of performance, uh, discussions and feedback loops and data citations. There's a whole bunch here you can dig into. We're, we're still working on documentation for this and we're interested in what you have questions about and, and what's going to be the most useful. You're going to find more stuff on GitHub. Some examples like the configurable apps examples that I showed you before are going to be helpful. I also want to show you a prototype just because I think it makes it more interesting. And this is something else that we've got on GitHub. We call this um, my street. So you can go to GitHub uh, slash Esri slash my street. And this is an example. Uh, this is another app where the same app here, it's dealing with data in Washington, DC. So you can plug in an address and see information about zoning, demographics and other categories. So it's one stop shopping for for uh, citizens to find out uh, hyper local information. Here's the same app in uh, Los Angeles. So we've done, got a different color scheme pointing at different data. So you can dig into this code and, and look at a really nice user-centric design that's very simple and polished and, uh, and pulls in data dynamically. So that's something that's pretty interesting as well. So back to the hub ready example and, and prototype. We got a few more minutes, so I couldn't resist the urge to just throw out a few more buzzwords at you for you to check out on your own. These are other open source projects affiliated with hub. Sonar is something that works. This is uh, letting the citizens ask questions of the data in a more conversational language. So you can use Alexa, or you can use Facebook chat, or you could use Slack. Uh, it's, it's got integrations built already for a few of those components and it's open source, so it could be extended. Um, that's something that, that was built as a hub prototype initially and has, has caught on and been used in a few different places. You might wanna check that out. Coop is what powers the open data downloads and it's something that we use in production, but it's also allows you to fetch data from other APIs that are not Esri services and match those up with Esri services in ArcGIS Online. So that's a, uh, some interesting stuff as well. And just to kind of bring it all home before we go to Q&A, uh, I couldn't resist the urge. I, I, I think this is definitely proof that my own nerdiness has has hit new limits. I, I think it's, it's super exciting to see the degree of uh, transparency in the hub team's change log that's, as we push out releases, we're, we're documenting pretty fine grained 
bugs that we're fixing, things that are getting added, things that are changing and, and even being removed when they're no longer necessary. So I was prepping the, this webinar yesterday and I refreshed this page and you could see in the last week we, re, we shipped a release on December 5th and then we shipped another release on December 12th. So this rapid release cycle is you know, proof that the hub team is, we're, we're practicing what we preach in terms of transparency and all of the sort of modern um, buzzwords, I guess is probably the, the cynical way to put it, but, but this idea of rapid deployment and user-centric design and, and, and you know, not doing a waterfall approach to our own development is something that we're proud of and we're, we're happy to be you know, chipping in on open source projects and, and doing all that stuff at the same time. So you can check out the change log and I guarantee you, you know, next week and, and, and next month and in a few months, you're going to see all sorts of new features being added and, and things, uh, things, being, th things being released that you're going to want to pay attention to. All right. So that is it for us in terms of the content for the presentation. I've, I promised that we would have links to all of the you know demos and slides so you can see there's there's a couple pages worth of resources that you can check out on your own if you have we we're happy that we've already got a lot of questions coming in but um, we're going to go through and try and do some some of that q a and reach out to us we're not going to get a chance to do all of it but amy do you have any uh words to share about uh, how we're gonna how how the Q and A is gonna go? Thanks, John. <clears throat> we're going to begin Q and A, um, answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still continue to submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Um, so just to get us started, um, the first question that came in: Will you get metadata with your data download? Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, let me take over the screen. I like a Q&A that includes screen demo, de demos. All right. So back to the example we were looking at before with the urban uh, forestry street trees. Um, the, there's actually a section here about viewing the metadata. And if you click view metadata, you're actually taken to the page on um, either their, the organization's server or their ArcGIS Online account, which shows their full metadata. In this case, they have, a, um, I think it's ISO something something, I always forget the spec, but they already had a, um, a configured metadata file set up. Um, if you didn't have that set up, it would take you to ArcGIS Online and the content you set up there. Um, when you download a um, spreadsheet or KML, that metadata doesn't come along as far as, I'm con as, far as I know. Um, and with a shapefile, it doesn't come either. If it would have to be, yeah, it's, it's the metadata just stays kind of where it's at. And from my perspective, you know, having, having participated in a lot of hackathons and, and community events, you know, what I've found uh, time and time again is that doing the legwork to have good metadata here in the item details page that that developers and, and other folks can access and learn about about the data set you know a lot of things that us gis folks find uh take for granted you know isn't as self-explanatory as we think so making sure that information here is, is really good and, and we wanted that to come across but uh yeah it doesn't make it into all the downloads but as long as it's accessible and, and kept up to date here uh in in our just online that, that is a big difference. So a lot of hackathons I've seen that have been successful have been data quality, QAing the, the data so that it can be useful and improved over time. Okay, the next question has to do with the community being able to edit open data. Can the public um, add input? Can they comment on specific features or create new features, et cetera? Um, yeah, so that is part of what we were looking at with the uh, community page earlier. Um, all of these comments are being made on specific data sets. Um, so in this case, if I go to collisions and injury data, this was a comment that was made directly on here. Um, so 
you see that comment section. When, when you're signed in, when you're a user that has already been, when you, you know, have gone through the follow, um, ask the, the follow workflow, um, or signed up through um, other places like in the reports tab, you would be able to comment directly on it. And, and we've definitely had sort of both sorts of concerns from users. Some some customers are saying we don't want you know customer citizens to be able to edit the data. We want to be the authoritative source. So this idea that the the sanctioned data sets are you know they're they're not necessarily editable themselves, but there's still a feedback loop. You know we want there to be a conversation. We want even when the data set is not editable from from the public. But then there's also this notion that when when hub citizen users can create their own account, they've got an area where if they want to spin up a data set for a discussion or, or do some editing of, of raw data and, and contribute to that discussion in a in a lower level way, they, they can do that as well. And there's there's a time and a place for that. Okay, great. Um, so is hub also an appropriate platform for a commercial service for example one that charges its members for access hmm that is a good question um i think i uh my root reaction to that is i know that you know we, we think of government agencies as the kind of first and foremost sort of people being interested in in this product but we have had interest from private organizations that are interested in it, using it as a employee uh, engagement tool as well. I haven't heard yet about a, a sort of notion of, of a productized, you know, it sounds like you're, you're looking like for like a white label thing. We'd have to check with the lawyers about that one. I don't know if that's on our radar or, or not, but that'll, we'll have to we'll look for the answer to that, a little more detailed answer to that one on Giona. Yeah, and I will, I will say that there is, um, we've talked about having internal only hubs or, you know, open data access um, it, for people who are on a firewall who want to be able to share data just within an organization. Um, and that is coming. I think last I heard it was coming in the middle of next year, um, being able to, to deploy an open data site or a hub site um, onto your own resources internally. Um, you know, currently you can you can have private hub sites and private groups, so you have to be signed in to ArcGIS Online to be able to access that. Um, so there are ways to do that. But as far as facilitating, um, like paying for access to a site, that hasn't been, I don't think, on the roadmap. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, is ArcGIS Hub part of Portal, or is it only on ArcGIS Online? Yeah, so that's like actually related to what I just was talking about. Um, so currently, um, ArcGIS Hub is only available on ArcGIS Online. Um, that is that is where the whole thing happens. So you register data sets um, on ArcGIS Online, you share those data sets to groups, and you make those groups available in Hub. Um, there is um, work being done on making that available on, on Portal, um, but it, that won't be probably until you see um, the user conference this year, which is usually in July. Okay, great. Um, is ArcGIS Hub a replacement for the ArcGIS Open Data, or is it completely separate? So it's actually, they're tightly woven together. So basically open data is now a capability of Hub. So we've taken all of the, the, the features and capabilities of open data and made that the backbone of this Hub product. Um, and those open data capabilities of sharing data out and making open data sites, all of that, that's always gonna be available along with an ArcGIS Online subscription. Um, the only things that are additional are those that automated initiative builder piece, which is, you know, I just click a button and it, and it makes uh, sites and and apps for me. And that community, and that community piece of having um, people be able to sign in from social logins um, to your initiative and following initiatives. Okay, great. We have another question about this related to it. To enable open data for Hub, 
Um, this user happens to have um, an ArcGIS online group shared publicly and then enabled um, for open data. However, they only want to share their hub page within their organization, particularly maybe for initial testing. So is there a way to enable open data without using a public group? Or basically, can an admin create an internal hub that is not open to the public? Uh, yeah. So um, if I go to my sites, this is all up uh, a section that we didn't really cover today. This is this is uh, all of the various sites that are available on your organization. And the way you control access is through this, this visibility kind of buttons. So you've got share with team, which would just be for anyone that's uh, internal. Share with, your, or share with the team is anyone who's internal that you've, you've assigned access to the initiative or the, the site. Um, there's share with your organization, which is anyone who is in your ArcGIS Online organization, and then there's share public. Um, you can have this in these two various versions of non-public, um, and you can also have uh, public, you can have private um, open data uh, groups. So if I go to the capabilities section, um, there are private item views. If, you, if this is enabled, then that means um, content that is shared to an open data group that is not um, set to public in ArcGIS Online would still show up in your open data searches when you're logged in and, and on that site. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, is initiative creation a permission that can be granted to an individual within an organization by the organization's administrator? Is the creator of an initiative then the administrator of the initiative? Question. So the way you control access to specific initiatives and editing is through uh, this, this uh, tab here called the initiative team. I click that, I can start adding um, members to that group. Of course, now it's not working. Is it that at the top? What was that? Is it the green? Oh. Yeah, that. yeah, so this is how you do it. I was searching for the other one. So now I'd be able to add um, Andrew to this uh, initiative, and then he would actually be able to edit the initiative and, and uh, make changes to it. Um, so in terms of who can create initiatives, that is controlled in this team section here. And you can add members. This is basically anyone who you want to be able to access the hub administration view, um, which is creating sites, um, creating initiatives, um, and doing community management. And you would be able to do that in here. So this would be anyone who is in your ArcGIS Online organization would show up here. Perfect. Does uh, Hub support multiple languages? You know, I don't. Do you have an answer about that, John? I Open Data had language support, but yeah, I, I we have, we'll have to double check. My my gut check reaction is is yes that all the internationalization that we've done for Open Data is that's all in sync uh, with Hub as well. I don't know if the language support exactly mirrors ArcGIS Online, but it's it's this is not just an English thing for sure. Okay, and then we have uh, maybe one last question. Can you embed a chart or link into an initiative from ArcGIS Hub on your organization's corporate website? Yeah, so this idea of, we've got a notion of cards and content in the Hub pages, and it's, there's an site, interactive site builder, but there's also, you know, this, when you use an iframe or something else, there's, we're, we're definitely thinking about this, this idea that the components might make sense and be useful to embed in other pages as well. So that's that's definitely something that you can do. Um, and and also, you know, it's 9.59 just before, if we, before we lose anybody, um, if I'll we'll go back, oh, I guess we don't even need to go back to the slide, but we're gonna be sending out a survey and we'd really love your guys' candid feedback about what you found the most valuable and, and what wasn't as interesting uh, as we present this more. We, Patrick and I both have a thick, thick skin, uh, so, so don't, don't be shy. Okay, great. And then one last thing, uh, John, was the link to your slide deck. Uh, some people were trying to make notation of that, if you can go to that. And then also, they were saying it wasn't actually working properly. So maybe you can take a look at that and just double check to make sure that, that that's okay. 
Well, yeah, either way, we'll we'll provide you with something on GeoNet. What, what's the best way for them to find it? They have to go to the GeoNet? Yes. Uh, Geonet group? Yes, the Geo Developer Group on GeoNet would be the best place. We're going to be posting a blog post there, answering all of the questions that did not get addressed within this webinar. So um, I just wanted to thank you, John and Patrick, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, ArcGIS Hub. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me using my email address in your follow-up email. Uh, once you leave today's webinar, like John was telling you, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. Uh, we will be providing a recording of this presentation, which will be available in 7 to 10 business days. It will be on the go.esri.com slash geodev landing page. So on behalf of Esri and our presenters, thank you again for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. In the, in the bit.ly link, it's a capital O, not a zero. Maybe that was throwing some people off. Thanks for joining us.